Um, welcome everybody to our third week in the UK Actives National Summit online series. So we are taking the month of November and every Wednesday afternoon to explore some of the issues um, and topics that are really pertinent to our sector. So in the first week, if you were able to join us, you would have seen a host of political and business leaders giving their perspectives. Last week, we had a really important session on research and evidence. And this week, we are focusing on the built environment. And really, that means, you know, focusing on our, all the urban environments that we live and work and play in, how they're changing, but crucially, what that opportunity and what that means for the physical activity sector. So lovely to have you all together. We've got a fantastic lineup for you. Please do get involved. We have um, the hashtag you'll find at the top of the slides um, on your screen. So the more conversation and debate we have, the better. So let me take you through our agenda for today. As mentioned, we have, we've got some fantastic keynote speakers for you. We've got Ibrahim Ibrahim, Managing Director of Portland Design, Kate Hardcastle, MBE, hugely respected consumer expert, and Louise Ellison, Head of Sustainability at Hammerson. Following a short break, we will then crack on into a panel discussion to, to sort of start investigating and digging a bit deeper into those big trends and, is and issues affecting our urban environments. And in terms of questions, I should add that we will be having that open for the panel session a little bit later, which takes me on to our housekeeping points very nicely. Just so you're all aware, this session is being recorded. Everyone will be on mute for the duration of it. If you have any questions, as mentioned, please drop them into your Zoom Q&A box at the bottom and our team will pick those up you know, as they come in. And if the session cuts off for any reason at all, please feel free to use just your original link that will bring you back into our session. Fantastic. So then it just leaves me to thank our partners, in particular, the City of London Corporation, Sport England and UK Active Strategic Partners, you know, really without whom we couldn't, you know, hold these sorts of events. So thank you for your kindness and generosity. Brilliant. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Let me introduce our first keynote speaker. So Ibrahim Ibrahim is the Managing Director of Portland Design. We're very lucky to have him. And Portland is a leading strategic branding and retail design business and has worked across a huge range of projects, including retail, F&B, consumer brands, shopping centers, airports, train stations, and lots of mixed use developments. So he's also a board member for the UK High Streets Task Force, which is looking at supporting the rejuvenation of high streets all over the country. So he's also an advisory board member for the Central London Think Tank, among other appointments. So huge experience and really looking forward to this. Ibrahim, it's all yours. Thank you, Sam. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and thank you very much for everyone um, who is elected to, to participate today and join this seminar. And I hope what I'm about to show you um, is of interest and some value. Um, I assume you can see my full screen there. Um, and yes, the future is not what it used to be. The future is moving quicker than ever before. And we are experiencing what we refer to as retail Darwinism, where consumers' expectations and behaviours are changing faster than businesses can adapt. And these changes are not to do with uh, uh, retail uh, 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 design trends or architecture or even technology. They're to do with a, a radical shift in the uh, relationship that consumers have with brands and branded places. So hello, as uh, Sam said, my name is Ibrahim. I'm the Managing Director of Portland. Um, and we're a strategic place and retail design business. Uh, and everything we do is around the future and making sure our clients' projects and places are future-proofed and future-ready. And we have a couple of mantras in our business, people and places, not buildings and spaces. For us, all projects must be driven by understanding the people and the essence of place. 
and the, and the buildings and the architecture and the interior design must be a byproduct of that. And we don't do badges. For us, branding is not about just logos and communication. It's about experience. Experience is the brand. And we always say citizen first, not consumer first, citizen first. People are citizens first before they're consumers. And if you treat them with uh, a duty of care, they will become consumers. I think that's really critical. And these consumers we call Generation C, not X, not Y, but C. And C because the demand from, uh, the, their key demand is control. Control in respect of, of, of convenience, of transparency, of, of, of understanding, of being completely in control with intuitive places, intuitive experiences. And of course, they are also constantly connected. They live an always on culture. They, they demand the ability to collaborate, collaborate with brands, collaborate and co-create and shape the future, shape the experience that they, they will be participating in. And of course, they want to build communities with brands and places at the center. Community is really, really critical. And of course, also they have a conscience. They care about the role a business, a brand, a place plays, not just in their lives, in their day-to-day -day lives, but also in the wider world. And this is becoming increasingly an important part of their decision-making. So they have the power to choose like never before. And they have what we've like, uh, uh, defined as 10 key traits that we believe all brands and, 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 and places must, must acknowledge and must respond to when developing uh, experiences um, in, 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 the, in the urban environment and, and in the retail space. They value freedom and choice in everything that they do. They love to customize and personalize. They scrutinize everything. They share everything, both physically and digitally. Sharing is a nat completely natural behavior. They demand integrity and openness. They don't want just entertainment in their play, in their leisure. They want it in work and in education. This informality, this aspect of play in everything they do is really critical. And they no longer see wellness as just a category. They want it imbued in everything. They demand wellness in all places and it must run through the DNA of all businesses, which we'll talk about later. They're commitment folks. They have less and, le less, and less commitment. They're promiscuous in, in terms of brands. They're not committed they're not committed to a place of living, a place of work, they're not committed to, 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 to politics, they're not committed to many, many things. Their, their, their commitment phobia is really critical. They expect everything to happen fast. They won't even wait five seconds for a YouTube video to buffer. And they expect constant newness, constant innovation, constant change, ephemerality drives uh, drives them and, uh, and, and, and motivates them. So this is a sea change, a sea change in consumerism, a sea change in urbanism, a sea change in, 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 in the behavior of our audience. And Generation C has a new relationship with time, with place, with other people and consumption. And my presentation is based around these four pillars that I'm gonna go on now to explain. Time, and these are the four pillars of future readiness. Time, well, we live increasingly transient life, busy lives. We demand brands to come to us, to be there when we want, how we want. We want um, a hyper, hyper convenience. This is a wheelies as an autonomous store with no, no one working in there. It's a bit like Amazon Go, but it's also mobile. It, it moves to where the footfall is in a given development. So in time, uh, under time, our consumers want things easy, simple, intuitive, when they want, how they want. Um, farm One is, is, a, is, is, is a Manhattan based hydroponic farm that grows rare herbs, edible flowers and microgreens that can be delivered uh, to, to New York restaurants just in 30 minutes. And um, Nike flagship um, speed shop, this is a, a, an offer which again expresses the real convenience where you pre-order your, your sneakers and you pick them up from, from this, uh, this kind of uh, pickup 
and, and reserve uh, system. And of course, as you walk into the store, the store recognizes that you're there and then can, can continue uh, promoting other, other elements of the store to you. So it's completely uh, uh, anonymous, uh, uh, autonomous. And grip fixing is a, is, a, is a convenience in the respect of a gym that combines with nightlife and, and, and a nightclub. So all in one location, that convenience uh, is also kind of an interesting take on, on a gym. And of course, we have many other types of, 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 of services, of, of, of offers that are, that are convenient luxury, uh, as we call them, these pit stop kind of offers that are, are, are very interesting and are, and are developing and, and growing. 63% of global consumers are willing to pay more for simpler brand experiences. Really uh, compelling stat, that is. And of course, the growth of the subscription economy and how, uh, how predictive analytics can begin to drive uh, um, fulfillment and, and purchase. And this is something uh, we worked on a, a little while ago for in, in Auckland in New Zealand. It's a, it's a robotic click and collect offer. Again, hyper convenient, hyper simple, and not in not too distant the future, um, we're going to see the the development of cars that can be controlled by apps. In fact, we have that now, and you'll be able to control the boot of your car, open it to accept shopping when you're not there. Very interesting for any any town centre, any development development that has car parking spaces. So this is about just in time living, this hyper convenience where we create value by stripping out complexity. The second pillar is place. What kind of places, what kind of new places are we going to want and are going to respond to these new expectations? Well, we've talked for many years about third place, this place between home and work, this place you hang out, um, you shop, you eat, you drink, you do your emails. Um, uh, and we began to think, you know, what is fourth place and what, how does fourth place begin to represent our new high streets and our, our new urban environments? Um, and of course, fourth place, this new notion of the shop, if you like, yes, it's of course going to be about retail still, transactional retail, this hybridization of retail where, where retail uh, mixed with F&B and wellness um, is, is a really interesting kind of hybrid like, and, and Lululemon are, are looking into doing, they're doing in their, in their fuel space in Chicago. It's also about hospitality, but hospitality, hotels that are more connected to community, form part of public realm, form, form part of workplace, uh, and, 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 and as I say, uh, uh, hotels that are much more connected. And of course, maker spaces are, are, are an increasing part, part of of, of that and how they can become part of our public realm uh, activation and combine and blend with retail and FB, as can learning and event spaces. And of course, culture, culture that's, that's much more activated and part of public realm, part of our high streets, and again, blended with, with retail and FB. And, and of course, more ephemeral experiences, pop ups. Interesting example of, 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 of Orange Theory, which is a, a gym which pops up in, in, in hotels and other places as an ephemeral kind of experience, but also as a, as a testing, a way of testing their, their offer. We call this Swatch, this new concept, this new idea around the new notion of, the, of, the, of, of retail, the new notion of the store, where shopping, where working, entertainment, learning, culture and hospitality blend together to create our new living rooms of the public realm. This is fourth place, this is Swatch, this is what's gonna drive our new reju rejuvenated high streets and shopping centers. And, and some great example, how, a great example of how we can reconfigure re, um, and repurpose our public spaces, our old shopping centers. And this is a very interesting example where this is a, a real sort of emphasis on health and wellness, uh, like an amphitheater for community events um, and also a rooftop space uh, for urban uh, uh, agriculture. Um, really interesting kind of repurposing of, of, of a public realm uh, of an old shopping center. As this is, this is a, 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 a previous car parking space uh, in Taiwan that has been uh, developed into a, a sunken park and public pool um, and, and a kind of lagoon, um, which is, as I said, a former underground car park with wellness at, it, at, it, at its heart. Really sort of interesting take on, on repurposing. 
In October, the NHS authorised doctors to prescribe nature to patients in the form of hiking and bird watching, where nature becomes part of a really important prescribed therapy. And this is a really interesting initiative um, in, in Rome called Rome Reforested, where they're planting three million trees, one per inhabitant. So really green, green Rome, again, wellness at, it, at, it, at its heart. In London, up to 36,000 deaths a year are attributed to long-term exposure to air pollution. This is a really a kind of important kind of stat, and you can begin to compare that to, to COVID, and this happens you know, every year. This is a really interesting in initiative in Bilbao, where bil billboards are being repurposed as public air purifiers, coated, uh, 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 coated signs with a, a, a treatment called purity print, purity print. Um, that removes pollutants, bacteria, mold, and bad odor from the air. Purifying effect is the equivalent of that of over 700 trees. It can convert any printed material into decontaminating elements. Very, very interesting how we can begin to use these different surfaces for this. And another interesting initiative in San Diego, where uh, on lampposts there's cameras, microphones, and sensors um, in fact, on 3,200 streetlights, um, which monitor traffic circulation, crowd sizes, parking spots, air quality, weather emergencies, and even gunshots. So this smart, smart uh, public realm, what we call quantified space, is really interesting how we capture the data um, and communicate that data. Increasingly now, post-COVID, people are looking for places that are safe, they feel safe in, from, a, from an environmental uh, uh, perspective in terms of uh, antigens and, 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 and other uh, harmful elements. And we've got to make sure we capture that data to be able to reassure our public. So create value by delivering immersive, enriching and healthy places. And deliver those experiences both fast and slow. Fast, which is hyper convenient, automated, zero touch, and slow, which is more immersive, participatory about community and learning and enriching type experiences. All brands must be able to deliver both fast and slow, each of them physical and digital. The third pillar is other people and community. As we live increasingly digitized lives, we crave meaningful analog experiences and community. We've got to shift from commodities to communities. We're going to create experiences that not just sell product, but bring people together around interests and behaviors like our urban outfitters here. So participation is the new consumption. How do we create participatory experiences that align and work with whatever product or service we're selling? And of course, Rafa is doing that very well through, through a whole series of communities around, around cycling and the passion for cycling through their clubhouses which are a hybrid retail, f and and community space, really activating our public spaces. And more, more of these kind of brands um, will, be, will be seeing it, it to, 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 to bring back life to our high streets. So we create value through communities of interest and a sense of belonging. And the fourth pillar is, is consumption. What is the new consumption? What is the expectation from, a, from, our, from our audience. Well, authenticity is absolutely at the center of this, um, where we can see Whole Foods growing produce in the, in, in, on the roofs of their buildings, in greenhouses. And we can see m and um, really interesting uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, initiative called InFarm, where herbs are, are freshly grown and harvested within the stores. And vertical farming units are controlled using a cloud-based platform, which can learn and improve to ensure each plant grows better than the last, using, using predictive analytics to make sure there's constant improvement. Really interesting. And the other demand is personalization, this, this idea of, 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 of the demand for increasing, increasing levels of personalization. And I suppose Vita Mojo is really at the kind of pinnacle of that in terms of um, DNA level personalization, how you can capture the DNA information and order uh, 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 each ingredient to make up your meal and each ingredient has nutritional um, uh, information and advice. And with John Lewis and Waitrose, um, this is, this is um, uh, where you provide a cheek swab for your DNA and customers are able to learn which foods are genetically suited to them. 
Genetic profile can be used by use the DNA Nudge app or the DNA band to scan over 500,000 food items and work out which are a healthy match for them. Really interesting initiative around DNA again. And, and Nike at Melrose again uses predictive analytics to uh, and, and social mapping to understand what the neighborhood is really interested in, what kind of brands, uh, uh, what kind of products they're interested in, and then each store in the neighborhood is personalized to that catchment in terms of how, it, how they're behaving on, on, on social, social networks to map that behavior. And we've got a whole series of different types of experience around wellness, which are more personalized, more intimate, and really sort of interesting opportunities for different types of experience. And Lazarenhof is a really interesting thing. It's something we've been talking a lot about recently where more and more medical services, medical therapies are being brought front of house to consumer facing this idea of a medical gym. An in-house MRI and IV infusion menu exists uh, at this place. Um, chirotherapy chambers, spine lab influenced by the aerospace training technology and an in-house MRI machine for body composition analysis. Of course, you can also have a massage and workout in the gym. But really interesting how the idea of more medical um, services and therapies are being brought into the consumer sphere. So what we're looking for, what people are really engaging with as much more about the ephemeral, the unexpected, the unknown, and the imperfect. Um, long gone are the days where people are looking for highly polished, highly finished environments. They're looking for much human scale, more human scale, more softer, more domestic, more biophilic type environments. And horticultural spa is a, a great example of an experience that, that um, uh, has, is like a living library of plants with, with a medicinal fog as you walk through that energizes or calms. And the plant essences in the fog have nutrients and minerals that can enter the skin. A really interesting kind of take on, 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 on a spa, which is, which is about convenience as well. And consumers are turning to nostalgia. We can see a growth and explosion in vintage, particularly in fashion, uh, and, and I'll say nostalgia and things that are more imperfect and real and human. And of course, turning to brands that demonstrate, not just talk about, but demonstrate a, so, a social conscience. So we'll create value by aligning your values to your audience. And what we're kind of working more and more on, we're looking at are these blended use wellness destination. How can we repurpose department stores? How can we repurpose buildings and repurpose shopping centers in many cases to blend and bring together physical wellness and, 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 and services mental uh, therapies, mental health therapies and mindfulness, and more and more medical treatments that can be brought, as I say, um, to the consumer sphere and blending that with beauty, retail and f and uh, to create a great blended use kind of destination that brings together all these components of, 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 a, of a consumer experience. So, Incremental improvements don't work in a world where change is not incremental. The world has changed and it's changing quicker and quicker, particularly post-COVID, post that acceleration of the trends that we've been talking about for a while. So it's no longer enough to do slightly better than before, slightly nicer environments, slightly shinier architecture. Post-COVID success will be determined by rethinking and reimagining the experience where wellness is no longer a category. Wellness must run through the bloodstream, through the DNA of all of our places, of all of our high streets, of all of the brands and, 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 and experiences. We've got to shift from crafting of environments to shaping of experiences. We no longer are interior designers as such. That's a byproduct of people and place, the shaping of the experience. Because those experiences, our high streets, our new places must speak like a magazine must change like a gallery, must engage like a show, must build loyalty like a club, must share like an app, must seed like an incubator, and must connect like a community. And to deliver that, we must have a people revolution. We've got to bring new types of people to this sphere. Curators and set designers, people from hospitality, storytellers, ethnographers, media buyers, data scientists, and social media specialists. These people must all come. It's no longer enough just to lease boxes and collect rents. 
we've got to really rethink how we how we operate and deliver these new ideas. And just to leave you with a thought, there are three types of people in this world and three types of business leader. Those who make it happen, those who let it happen, and those who wonder what happened. Don't wonder what happened. Let's get future ready. Thank you. Oh, I mean, thank you so much, Ibrahim. I mean, just so much um, in that presentation and so much to talk about. And I think some of the innovation is just off the charts and I hope gives our community lots of food for thought and we'll definitely come and discuss some of that in our panel later this afternoon. So on Thanks, to our sir. next, pleasure, Ibrahim. Um, the next um, keynote, we've got another phenomenal um, and experienced consumer expert. Um, we have Kate Hardcastle MBE with us. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. Global go-to consumer specialist, Kate Hardcastle is a, is a multi-award winning business consultant and commentator. She's also a highly respected media business presenter and reporter. You would have seen her and I certainly look out for her commentary on TV and radio. You might have seen her on Channel 4, ITV, BBC, Sky, CNN. She's also a regular contributor to Forbes.com. But also Kate has been phenomenal in championing good causes over the last 25 years. And in 2009, she founded Access for All, which is a campaign which sees Kate and the Insight with Passion team donate 20% of their time to supporting small businesses and community projects free of charge. And to date, they have supported over 1200 organizations. In 2018, Kate was awarded an MBE by Her Majesty the Queen for services to business and entrepreneurship. And you know, I'm sure we'll have a phenomenal keynote from her. So Kate, all yours. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Samantha. What an amazing collective of people we've got here today. All credit to the good work that UK Active are doing. Um, let me just get to the screen and I will start because I know we're slightly running uh, behind schedule. I'll see if I can catch that up for you, Samantha. But um, I want to make sure we are able to give everyone the full, the full effect. Uh, a very good afternoon to you all. The Great Rethink. You've heard a little bit about me and I will waste no time um, giving any more information. Uh, you can find me online should you want to connect and we can chat. If you could start from the beginning again, what would you change? How would you use your learning to evolve decisions and plans you'd previously made? This is not a case of talking about regret. This is simply the permission to change the course. Right now, the world is enabling the great rethink. Living the day-to-day -day of our global pandemic has connected us all with an opportunity to reorder our priorities, be that out of necessity or choice. The year 2020 has been for many a chaotic disruptor and has also acted as a catalyst for change. We were reconnected with supporting and teaching our children in different ways. We felt the pain of the disconnect from our wider family and friends. Many of us pledging that the next time we were back together, we would engage with the moment more and soak up the privilege of being able to do so. We found pleasure in wide open spaces and a different level of appreciation for nature and our surroundings. We realized how much stuff we had and actually how little we needed to get by. We embraced the need for self-care, we prioritized our well-being, and many reconnected with fitness, finally finding the time and the understanding of how important it is in our lives. We were living through the great rethink. We didn't have chance to say no, or we don't do it that way here, or we need a team of people to rubber stamp this. We evolved quickly, many embracing the outcome of our new normal. A chain reaction of change sparked globally. And whilst we went through change as people, we recognized that organizations and places we engage with also needed to feel and act with humanity. This can't be about corporate social responsibility any longer. Responsibility is an obligation to do something. This is the way in general we describe our corporate social standing, our corporate social responsibility. Be that to plant trees, to donate money to good causes, generally and responsibly just be better in our endeavours. Responsibility has not ignited all the change that the public want to see from leaders. 
because we need authentic organizations we need respectful organizations and we all need organizations that genuinely care leaders who can understand that the future critically depends on being successful in making our organizations and the programs we deliver more human the tidal wave of covid-19 has churned up this seabed of so many issues waiting to be properly dealt with and the urgency and the immediacy of the tide is proving uncomfortable for so many organizations we're dealing with a deadly global pandemic yet ceos are being looked to to right the wrongs of generations past and ensure they tackle a crisis in diversity and mental health isolation and climate all at the same time we are weary from fighting the fire the pandemic has fueled dealing with an exhausting right here right now that feels every moment has been taken since march but there's a new dawn on the horizon and it's going to need the very best from all of us to use this reset to the best of all of our opportunities this generation will be the change makers as baton carriers in a relay race this generation is not the anchor leg runner the last position ready for the final sprint no, our generation of leaders require all the tenacity of the second or the third runner often carrying the baton the furthest distance without feeling the glory of the finish line and as change makers with such a significant agenda we must accept that this is a time to feel vulnerable it is okay to feel vulnerable and not know all the answers right now but we must have that thirst to find out and be brave enough to make the changes our greatest gift is taking time to listen to ask the uncomfortable questions and then find ways to hardwire into our organizations the change that's really needed it all starts with listening and it's incredibly human to want to be listened to in this 3 for 1 crisis of the global economy of health diversity and climate it's time to reflect and reset the future will be different and while the world is interconnected to a greater intensity than ever before it's also incredibly fragile and we are fragile too in 2019 the world health organization recognized burnout as an occupational phenomena in the international classification of diseases and at the same time the 40th anniversary of the first ever climate conference where 11,000 scientists in 2019 declared that planet earth was facing a climate emergency we were frangible before we'd even heard the phrase covid-19 an unprecedented on repeat we know we need a remedy fast profitable business and purposeful practice should no longer be treated as some form of contradiction covid is our disruptor yes and we have to attend with immediacy to the on off lockdowns and keeping our teams and our communities and ourselves safe history tells us that pandemics of the past have redeveloped the economy pushed creative thinking beyond comfortable boundaries and changed the course of the trajectory we have to ensure the tracks are laid for a different course we should do well by doing good just 12 months ago I was honored to present my keynote as part of the UK Active Summit to the point of building bridges not thrones a, a complete mantra for me my my life through and I talked with particular attention to how our high streets could be redeveloped my clear message was that we needed collaborative change to create human high streets adaptable ready to support the communities that want to use them i highlighted some internationally recognized best practice in place making and also pointed out some very obvious yet quite basic improvements that many places needed if our high streets were to evolve into centers for all our communities to come together and feel a sense of belonging and sport and activity could play a very pivotal part in that then people would plan to spend more time there and if that was the case there would need to be access to essential facilities clean toilets changing areas affordable and reliable transportation links and the reassurance of feeling safe and secure at all times of day my speech was a call to achieve more by working together in progressive strategic alliances and partnerships that would evolve the translation of our high streets from dinosaurs reliant on retail to authentic places to be 
in a quest for a human high street, the reward would be a place to enjoy the joy, the joy of connection. And that would in turn slow down the rapid isolation epidemic. I drew attention to our many thousand homogenized high streets designed by default around retail and its transactions. And I emphasized how important it was that places need to be created for all, collaboratively bringing together a wide range of sectors and expertise and the full inclusion of the most important of stakeholders, the community that would use it. I talked about the importance to provide a safe and supportive social space that engaged with communities and added an enriched to everyday life. There's been an acceleration of the trends I discussed. COVID-19 has changed nearly every element of our daily lives, including our attitudes and behaviour as consumers. The consumer awareness towards less is more is intensifying. We have started to move towards owning less and doing and seeing more. But this year, the consumers felt that they've got even greater reason and rationale to want less stuff. When restrictions are lifted, we can expect this resurgence of consumers wanting to focus more on, on experiences rather than materialism. The resurgence of local and how much we need a vibrancy of all types of business offer, great and small, working collaboratively and supportively with a common passion for place has been brought about even more. And we can see that conversations on social media about shopping and supporting local were boosted 111% this summer. We've also seen an increase in the tempo for collaboration and simplification. Organizations have had to adapt at speed and in doing so, many have had to join up and work together to survive. We've seen this in the most basic, basic of examples where local greengrocers, butchers and bakers have enlisted the help of taxi companies to create an overnight delivery service and help vulnerable members of the community. This is the time to remind organizations that one of the most effective and affordable catalysts for change is the power of collaboration. And to ensure that in every place, teams creating our high street destinations are doing so to include sports and the activity sector, hospitality, arts and culture, include the educators, the manufacturers and the caregivers, as well as the retail and hospitality sectors. The route to greater placemaking will see the need to open up the multi-layered set of organisations and authorities, all responsible in part for the curation and the involvement of place. When the Center of Progressive Policy researched consumers to understand thoughts about business at the beginning of the year, 80% of them wanted businesses to step up and do more. Research also highlights that 64% of consumers are now belief-driven buyers who want brands to deliver on societal issues as well as products. And despite a need for constant value and convenience, consumers will vote with their wallets. The consumer giant Unilever revealed in 2019 that its sustainable living brands grew 69% faster than the rest of the business and delivered 75% of its growth. We urgently need to turn the boardrooms inside out and involve stakeholders into the planning and make the change on small scale as well as grand so that there is positivity in change. By seeing demonstrations of change and receiving an invitation to be involved with it, it helps us to convert citizens into ambassadors and we can expedite the positive impact. We urgently need the shake up and wake up of the board to help create an outside in way of thinking. We need to involve stakeholders in planning and make changes on a small scale as well as a grand one. So that when there's positive change actually afoot, they embrace it. By seeing demonstrations of change and receiving that invitation to be involved, I know we will convert citizens into those ambassadors who can expedite the positive impact. So one year on, we're truly reminded that nobody could have predicted this current stage of the nation. Every single point raised in the keynote last year has been made all the more important and urgent as the ant anticipated shift to online, engagement with technology and impact on the isolation crisis has seen years of change in just a matter of months. In media interviews in March this year, just after the first lockdown, I was asked about the possible impact COVID-19 may have on retail. I suggested we could see the involvement of change we anticipated by 2025 in a matter of months. Nike CEO John Donoghue recently confirmed 
we are accelerating what probably would have happened in the retail environment naturally in the next four to five years, but we're going to drive in our business in the next one to two years. A challenge to create and what is needed in our high streets and communities is that those with the most essential roles in delivery will have carried a heavy load during the COVID-19 pandemic with regards to finances and time. The pressure placed on local authorities, businesses from all sectors and communities have been exponential and needing excessive financial spend and new levels of time and commitment. To make the change we need to see happen, we cannot simply accept that we need to put more pressure on those essential to making it happen. What we need to do is highlight how the change can be made effectively, efficiently and as natural as possible to move into the next phase. It is time to embrace open and engaging communications around the sport and the activity offer. Every, even the word sport can immediately create a barrier for some. Yet to see the health and well-being improvement we all want to see, we have to find ways to open up the conversation. While sports and fitness advertising has come a long way in terms of the journey towards inclusivity, we're still faced with multiple images on a daily basis, particularly on social media, which are focused on the unrealistic body types. When we have authentic, human and positive communication, conversations and communications about fitness and what it can involve and how integral it can be to place, we can open this to a wider conversation. How do we welcome the dog walkers, the gardeners and the skateboarders to take flight in the shared spaces we've created for them in our central locations? Google searches for buy a puppy have increased by 166% since March 2020. And 10% of homes without a pet say they intend to purchase one within the next six months. Now, as a side note, I have to be responsible and add the reminder here to adopt not shop. Consider the way in which the opportunity for fitness is currently presented, often quite a separate standalone offer and understand how with the creative uh, creativity of the boundaries of activities, we could break past the walls of the current facilities and become part of the everyday. Indeed, sports and activity could be the connector. Understanding how to position this and communicate this opportunity is key. I often return back to the fact that a family who may rarely achieve 10,000 steps a day will happily walk 10 to 12 miles a day when they're in a theme park because the offer's not based around activity, but the enjoyment of the entertainment. The activity is simply a necessary requirement, but it's not communicated as a task. We need to inject joy into the activity, be it the dog walkers or the space hoppers. Let us feel we can move more. Let us liberate our ideas by utilizing technology to its fullest potential. No longer should we see the idea of technology as being a distraction from activity, but an enabler and an accelerator. Smart businesses and organizations have accelerated the use of technology very wisely this year. We've seen more emphasis on the offer of digital, the physical and digital, and we've supported clients to create a connected future. For my business personally, we've worked in partnerships to take the opportunity to use digital to help with the convenience, the safety checks, the wait times, the check-ins, the queues. And we've embraced the idea of this multi-level environment to allow experience to be maximized. We enable using it, we, we don't disrupt the flow. We need to help reconnect our generations with one another and bring more acceptance and understanding and how we can live harmoniously side by side, learning from one another. And believe it or not, technology has been one of the solutions we've used to help clients deliver this. It's time. It's time to get inventive with spaces, to repurpose the space and the buildings already in existence, to get the buy-in of all stakeholders, public, private, third and fourth, to understand how this can help build skills and education, to engage with our health and well-being, to understand what we can do for our much hurt arts and culture, to make it sustainable, and to think of the infrastructure and the connections. We've all something to learn from one another. Working together for innovation can reduce duplication, streamline operations and maximise our effectiveness. This change so desperately needs one simple thing, collaboration. We must firstly listen. Listen to all of those with an invested interest in the future of our high streets 
listen to those and engage with those stakeholders we never even knew existed. We need to listen and to learn from those leading the change and those doing things differently. Then we must work together on evolving everything we do with regards to our planning for the future of our high streets, our communities and our health. Never has there been so much emphasis on place. 2020 saw us transform the places we call home into our offices, schools, gyms, yoga, yoga studios, even a pub, um, if you lived in my house. Now we need to transform the towns and cities we also call home, applying that same approach with our places, truly reflecting how we live our lives today and to be agile enough to adapt with this. We must do so with a hugely important health and wellbeing agenda in mind. We must have solutions that can embrace all and deliver all the benefits of the great outdoors whilst innovatively providing practical solutions that work with the reality of the great British weather. We should embrace urban beauty spots and architectural achievements in the same way we appreciate our green spaces, combining exercise, art, socialising, shopping and more when we gradually venture back into our town and city centres. The Great Rethink could bring about change if we genuinely and meaningfully listen, learn and most importantly, take action. I'd like to stand here well, I'd not actually, I'd like to be back with you all in a hall next year for UK Active Uprising. And I'd like to be celebrating how this great rethink took flight and became the great reshape for everyone in every place. The great reshape of how we work together, live together and create places to enable the very best possible versions of life for everyone. And um, thanks for bearing with me, I realized just perfectly on time now. Um, I, I, I was so excited about one piece, I repeated it twice, but that's just because I really believe in this. I really look forward to connecting with everyone again in some kind of human format. Until then, stay safe. Thanks for letting me talk to you today. And let's do this. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for that. Another ins hugely inspiring keynote. And I love that sort of challenge to the boardroom, but how place has become so fundamental now to everything and that sort of acceleration of trends you know looking for you know i'm sure our panel will have loads to say on that so thank you kate and look forward to you know i'd love to have your opinion as the year progresses how you think whether we are grasping that challenge that would be fantastic to hear from you later thank you samantha take care kate Brilliant. Gosh, the afternoon is zooming. Fast. Where's the time going? Okay, so our final keynote for you this afternoon before we move into the panel is, and I think moving on really in a, in a smooth way from both Ibrahim and Kate's presentations is the real estate perspective. So we have a keynote now from Louise Ellison from Hammerson, and she is the group head of sustainability there. She joined in September 2013 and is responsible for developing Hammerson's Positive Places Initiative and really ensuring that its shopping centres developments continue to meet challenging sustainability targets. Prior to that, she was at MNG looking after the sustainability strategy across its real estate portfolio. And prior to that, she was at Quintain Estate. So, you know, hugely experienced professional and really a leader in this space. So it is with pleasure that I introduce Louise. Louise, all yours. Thank you very much, Sam. It's uh, great to be here this afternoon. Um, lovely to, to see everybody. Um, so yeah, Sam's given you a bit of an introduction um, to me and um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Hammerson. Um, I think um, probably having listened to Kate, we would be, I'm slightly nervous about being the dinosaur that's just sort of entering on stage left. Um, Hammerson, are a, we're a landowner, we're a, la we're a landlord. Um, and uh, uh, we, we focus particularly on retail um, assets at the moment. Um, we have large shopping centers uh, uh, across the UK, um, also in, in Ireland and in, and in France as well. We're a, we're a long-term um, owner of assets. So we come very much from the perspective to this of, of how do we actually make that business model work 
um, in a in in a in in the city centre location, um, and and in the towns and cities up the up and down the country. So I'm I'm quite interested in 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 talking a little bit today about about that business model, about what we bring to those spaces, and and what other landlords do as as well, as well as being the um, the the head of sustainability at Hammerson. I also chair an organisation called the Better Buildings Partnership. Um, which is an organisation of, uh, of about 35 different landlords and, and, and property owners of the, and fund managers who own a huge amount of real estate across the world. Um, and uh, everybody is very, very concerned to make sure that, um, the, 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 those businesses and, and, and those real estate portfolios are thriving. So that's very much the perspective from which I come and from which I'm talking today. So as a landowner and a landlord, um, our business model uh, is, uh, is really about um, essentially providing an operating platform. That's all we do. We provide an operating platform for other people to use. Um, it might be a business for somebody to use, you know, it might, might be for, for, for somebody to use for, for running their business from. It might be a, a, a platform on, on which somebody is living, but essentially it is just a platform. Um, so we have to make sure that that, that that space that we provide, that platform that we, we, we provide is, is giving everybody who needs it um, and who wants to use it um, the right facilities and, and is in the right place. We have to provide a platform that is going to be needed and wanted by, by, by those sectors for which there's demand. We have to provide that in the right mix. We have to provide that we, ha we have to make sure that we're providing all of the things that people who, uh, who, who are looking for that space want so that they continue to come to us because that's all we do. It's a very simple business model. We provide, a, we, we provide the platform, other people come and, and, and use it. So ultimately, then it becomes really about it's about footfall. It's about creating places where people want to live, places where people want to work, places where people want to play, places where people want to create things, places where essentially people want to stay for a little while. Um, so it's, it's about creating something that's interesting, that people are going to enjoy um, and a place where people are going to want to hang around. Currently, we, as I said, we're predominantly a retail business. Um, and but obviously retail has been changing and retail has been in a state of flux for for a number of years. Um, and as Kate has referred to very eloquently, the last year has accelerated that quite exponentially. But this has been a business that this, this sector has been in a state of flux for quite some time. Um, and the work that's been done um, for, for, for high streets um, and, and that task force that has been going on uh, way pre pre preceding COVID. There's been a lot of work looking at how we kind of reimagine those, those, those high streets because of the changes that are happening to the retail sector. And businesses like Hammerson are absolutely in the center of all of that. But that's true of any landlord. So we happen to be a larger one that's focused on, uh, on, on malls, but, but it's the, same, the same is true of high streets. Anybody who's owning, owning assets and owning property in those kinds of spaces is, is trying to resolve how, how, you know, how, we, how our business model is going to operate um, in a situation where retail has changed completely. Whatever the assets we have, we need them to be used. So that means we need to evolve them. Um, and whoever those owner, uh, whoever that owner is, they need it to be used in the same way. So if you're a local authority owner, then you need to you, you need to have that those asset use because it drives local tax local taxes. Um, well used, thriving local centres, they drive land values, they drive drive economic benefits for everybody. So it works very well for everybody if you have that that virtuous circle of of a, of a, of a well managed, well run. Um, uh, land holdings in the in a town center or in a local area that that really can de generate those economic benefits and keep them coming but to do that you need strategic planning you need to be able to see these things coming and you need to be able to plan for them you need to be able to make adjustments to your business model to make sure that actually you're out of the way of what's been referred to as the gray rhinoceros when it heads towards you the pandemic that we're facing now, no, it wasn't necessarily foreseeable that it was going to happen in 2020, but the fact that we were going to have a pandemic at some point, that was absolutely foreseeable. And we needed to have things in place in order to try and manage that. It's the same with climate change. It's absolutely foreseeable what is happening with climate change. Um, we need to have a plan in order to, to, to deal with that and make that happen and, and, and manage that effectively. The same is true around retail. It has been very evident for a number of years what's going to happen with retail and the transition to online and the change in people's consumer habits. So there has to be a plan in place in order to make sure that our spaces continue to thrive and are able to respond to that. So it needs strategic planning. Um, it needs some really clear oversight and that creativity that comes with it. It also ultimately requires investment. 
And that's one of the benefits that a business like Hammerson can bring. If you have larger landowners, uh, landowners and landlords in an area, we have access to capital. We have an incentive to make a place thrive because as long as a place is thriving, that's what drives our, our land values. That's what helps our business model. It can be much more difficult if you're working in an area where, where you've got multiple ownership, if you've got streets that are under multiple ownerships, and if you've got short-term capital involved, if you've got if you've got people who are, or, or businesses who are not necessarily there for lo the long term, it can be much more difficult to make this transition work. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to bear in mind as we rethink the spaces and we, th we think our town and city centres. How do we think about local? Uh, how do we think about and align local ownership models? Because you've got to be able to get that long-sighted strategic thinking in place, and you've got to be able to finance it properly. So where do we make manage to make that come from? The focus here, obviously, is very much around active lives. And, and, and as Kate said, this has been really thrown into the spotlight this year. We've all struggled with lockdown. But a lot of this transition to, 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 to activity was happening way before 2020. Um, you, you, will, uh, you, you as the audience will be very, very well aware of the, the transition and the, 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 this has happened in terms of sport and fitness over the last few years. This has been a massive growth area. You know, we we love having gyms, yoga studios, cycling cycling outlets, all sorts of things across the across our our, our, our malls and our shopping centres. These have been growing really fast alongside the sportswear brands that go with them. The proportion of space that's been devoted to them has increased steadily, increased in in, in recent years. We've got a really challenging time at the moment. And, but the actual transition isn't really going to go away and it's going to evolve. These aren't going to diminish these things. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to look different and uh, different communities are going, different demographics are going to want different things. And we're already seeing that beginning to emerge. We've already seen it evolving into an experience, not a purchase. So this whole move away from necessarily the, 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 of purchasing things in order to, towards purchasing experiences is happening quite rapidly. Sports retailers, including studios, offering classes, all of these things are just the beginning of that kind of, that, of that kind of trend. We already have that happening across the portfolio. Things like, you know, yoga studios that we have, these things align really well with the with, with a, with a different types of business because you get a different type of user and people staying. People, you know, they, 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 they're very, very complementary to each other in terms of dwelling and football. So in pre-COVID pre times, we had yoga sessions on our mouths, which were incredibly popular. Um, we have a, a beautiful shopping centre in, in Marseille where the Mal is overlooking, we've got big terrace overlooking the Mediterranean. Um, the yoga sessions there were incredibly popular, but um, and hopefully they'll they'll happen again at some point. But but that kind of activity, changing the way in which we use that these these spaces is increasingly important. As I say, the sector is evolving. We need to understand that. We have to get ahead of it. And as a long-term owner of asset, what we want to, what we have to do is really be looking at the future and understanding what's coming, not what's not just about what's happening now, but what's going to happen in the future. That's 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 that can be very challenging at times. Um, but but that's kind of the beauty of what we do. And that's that that's the, the plus side and the upside of being a long-term investor in some way. You can see you can spend your time getting to understand an area and really thinking about what's going to come, what's coming down the line towards you. So it's not just about how it's happening now, it's about what's happening next. Um, what also can make it difficult is with an with assets like ours, if you've got large assets, um, it, it can be incredibly it can be incredibly time consuming and capital intensive to make strategic and dramatic changes to them. So for us to make big changes to a to to a, a large shopping centre, if we own we own the Bullring in 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 Birmingham, if anybody knows that shopping centre, we own Brent Cross in North London. These are big shopping centres that 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 take a huge amount of money to transition into something else. Um, even if we wanted to do that, but they, they take a long time to transition. Um, so we're talking about years in order to, and substantial capex to make major changes to them. So in order to respond, then we need short-term strategy to run alongside this, changing the mix, bringing in fresh, bringing in lo local businesses, bringing in different types of user is a much quicker way of refreshing a lineup than, than, than making a wholesale physical change to an asset. 
we have teams that work on commercialization, work on our temporary and short lettings specifically to capture this type of work. We anticipate this type of this area of work increasing, particularly as we start transitioning um, and changing uh, large areas of space that has been dedicated to department stores, for example. All of that work is, change, is, is, is happening now. Um, we are, we are, are working with a lot of different types of business to bring different types of user in. And much of this often is around healthcare, it's around uh, activity, it's around, well, it's around well-being. These are the areas that, that, that are really growing and that people are interested in. It's also about a lot of leisure activity as well, a lot of leisure and recreation. So different types of experience that are going on within the spaces. One of the barriers to bringing these types of business in, and particularly um, for short periods, is often the very traditional rental model that we have. And going back to the kind of slightly, um, slightly, I suppose, mundane element of actually what it is that makes businesses like ours tick. That traditional rental model is, 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 is really tied up the whole industry for a long time. Our business, like others um, of, of a similar type, we're valued on the basis of the value of our assets. Those, those assets are valued on the basis of the rents that we can achieve for them and the leases that are, are agreed. Changes, those changing, changes to these terms of engagement therefore carries huge risk. So if we suddenly change the way in which we let stuff, if we change the way that the rents at which we the rents which we charge, then that carries risk for the business because it starts to change the way in which starts to challenge the way in, 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 in the way in which businesses like ours are valued. But the flip side of that, of course, is that not changing them also carries huge risk. So if the traditional leasing model within our industry is preventing us from making our space available to the businesses that we want and need to work with, and those businesses that would be broader of broader benefits driving footfall, of broader benefit to the local area where we have those assets, then that, that model needs to change. That's something, something that we're working on now. It's not, it's not easy, but it, at the same time, it's not optional. And the industry as a whole is working very hard to try to rethink how we go about doing this, because clearly the traditional model isn't going to work for the long term. So we need to really start reviewing that. There's also an issue around the spaces outside. I've talked about obviously the land that we own, the land that we hold, but as a landowner, we also have to look at the spaces outside our assets. We don't operate in isolation. We operate within a community and within, you know, you know alongside other landowners and, and also alongside the, uh, the, the public realm spaces that we have. And that means that we have to provide areas for local communities, people to use and enjoy. Um, that's what really, again, it, this, this is what, we, what will drive value. This is what makes people want to be in a place. It can be quite challenging to do that, particularly if you're doing new development, because you can't commercialize that space. And the traditional models of working, of working out whether or not you can build something, look at how much of that space you can commercialize. So drive, so providing green spaces, squares, courtyards, things that you can't actively immediately rent or work out a rent for, they become much more challenging. So we can struggle to do that. But again, the developments that we're looking at now and, 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 and that a lot of people are, and a lot of the expectation that's coming with developments happening now, this is, what, this is what has to happen. This is what has to be alongside those spaces if you're going to get long-term value out of them. And I think this year has really highlighted this importance of space for everyone. I think the conversation is going to be incredibly different as we move forward from COVID-19 about what the local spaces and local communities are, uh, local communities are expecting. They simply won't accept development that doesn't allow for this type of space anymore. And I think this also feeds into something else that I wanted to touch on a little bit today, which is health and well-being, and particularly mental well-being, which I think is incredibly important here. The landscape that we spend our lives in has a profound impact on us. It has a profound impact on our health. And we've, we've you've talked, you've heard earlier about some of the um, thinking around uh, oh, oh, what the implications of that are and around how, how active people can be and how we need to collaborate and we need to make that much more effective. So this has a profound impact on our health and it particularly has a profound impact on our mental health. We have never before seen such a change um, and such a complete revolution as COVID-19 has brought for us in terms particularly of flexible working in the way in which we work. And I don't think that flexible working genie is going to go back in the bottle. The health and well-being bonus this could provide for us is huge. Moving away from the traditional eight hours day uh, in, in working in a particular space have really, has really kind of gone, I think, now. We've been pushing for a long time to move to a more flexible working model, but it, it's, been a, it's been a long sort of road. It's, been a, it, it, it's taken us a long time. 
But suddenly, because of what we've been forced to do, it's been made very apparent that we can work in this way very, very effectively and still be incredibly productive. So we've suddenly freed people up to fulfill a role rather than to fill a, rather than fill a number of hours. They're doing a job in a way that allows them also to fit in exercise, to fit in families, to fit in caring responsibilities, to suddenly take charge of their day and their hours in a way that's completely different to how we've looked at that before. That has the potential to really drive better health and well-being, particularly through giving people much more time to be active. I know, I, pers speaking personally, I've been much more active in over the, over the last nine months simply because I'm not having to do that commute. Who on earth realised that nobody has time to commute? It also means that we've rarely spent so much time in our homes and neighbourhoods, and this is making us much, much more engaged with what's going on around us. It's driving an expectation that what is around us is going to be improved. The air quality is going to be improved. We're not going to accept local, local development plans that don't that, 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 that don't provide us with the, with the much needed community uh, infrastructure that we've wanted for so long. We want to be able to support, to support local stores. We want to be able to actually be fully engaged in the community in a way that many of us haven't had time to before because we've simply not been there because we've been at an office. So I think that flexible that flexible working healthcare will that flexible working revolution will provide with it a, a healthcare fitness well-being revolution because it provides so much opportunity. There's a huge change that's going to come. And landlords and landowners like us are starting to look at okay, what does that mean for us and what does that mean in terms of what we are able to provide and the way in which we can engage with those communities around them and the way in which we can actually properly support that. Lastly, I, I haven't mentioned climate change yet, and it's, but it's hard for me not to mention climate change. As Sam said, I'm the head of sustainability at a company at, at, at Hammerson, so climate change is very much what I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. This is already presenting challenging challenges for us in terms of uh, physical risk for for many of the of the locations that we have, and that's going to get more extremes, more extreme. Our cities, our regions, our towns, everywhere needs to be showing very much showing due respect for what is going to come in terms of climate change and what that's going to bring. And in many respects, that means that we need to be even more focused around the provision of green spaces, biodiversity, all of those things that really are good for us in terms of health and well-being, but also good for us in terms of good for the environment, in terms of providing uh, carbon sinks and providing flood risks, fl flood plains, providing that space. We really need to be protecting and really fighting for those spaces to make sure they stay undeveloped. The playing fields, the parks, the allotments, all of those outdoor spaces are absolutely essential, but have been under threat for so many years. So we need to make sure that we are really fighting to protect them and adding to them as much as we can. The Prime Minister set out his 10 point plan this morning. Part of that included building, included the planted and planting of trees and a recognition of biodiversity. I certainly hope we're going to go much further than what has been set out so far. Um, there's certainly a lot of opportunity and definitely um, a need to be able to address that more, uh, more ambitiously in many ways. So we need to value those things properly, not just to protect them, but to add to them and to build on them. Um, and that movement towards sports, fitness, health and activity is very much part of the argument for that. The two go hand in hand. So I think our local, our regional, our city centres, they've always evolved. We're seeing that happen in double speed at the moment triple speed you know we're seeing it happen so fast it's been brewing for some time but there has been there often has to be a catalyst that prompts something to change and and I think what we've seen over the last nine months has been that fantastic catalyst to prompt that real shift it's a fantastically exciting time for these spaces there is a huge amount of opportunity and a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation that things will happen um, so we've got the we, we need we need to, to, to grasp this opportunity and take it forward. We need to capture that mood. We need to work with it. And if we do that, I think we'll see all re we'll see real change and huge bonuses come our way. We'll kick off then with our panel um, and Louise will join us. Let me I'll make some introductions across. Um, across our fantastic lineup and I know we've run over a little bit and we want to get to the, the heart of the conversation. So um, Louise, as I mentioned, will be joining us following her keynote. Um, also as part of our panel to discuss some of these major issues, we have Carl Brooks, Head of Sustainability at CBRE. Um, he is really responsible for establishing sustainability as a key service line within property manager, management and a core competency across, across all employees working across property for CBRE. 
We also have David Melwish, who is Development Director at the Gym Group, who joined Gym Group in April 2013 and has successfully opened 140 gyms to date, phenomenal growth. And previous to that, he was Head of Development and Facilities at Central England Cooperative, managing a huge estate of, 300, of over 300 training properties. We also have with us Keith Bottomley, Deputy from City of London, Keith holds elected public office for the City of London Corporation, widely involved in leading on youth, education, climate change, environment and broader policy agendas. And he's chairman of the City of London Corporation's Policy Committee. And then we also have with us James Fennell, Chief Executive at Litchfield, overseeing corporate direction and strategy of the business, advising clients on long-term strategies on major development opportunities, asset management, um, in relation to plan making and development management issues. And G Jim also has a significant amount of experience advising the public sector um, on, on these areas. So we have a really experienced panel. Um, and I want to just kind of get into some of those um, issues around trends in particular, because all of our keynotes mentioned you know, how things have been changing in retail, in the urban environment, we're seeing kind of, you know, this strong high desire for a large amount of housing now, you know, the Prime Minister's sort of roadmap to a green recovery. So I wanted to ask the panel, in terms of those sort of trends that have been happening for the last five, year, five years, how many do you feel have accelerated? How many do you think are here to stay? And what role does physical activity have in that, you know, for our community who are looking to their future? What does this sort of multitude of trends, what do you think that means for them? Um, I mean, Keith, could I pick on you first and get your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, you sure can, Sam. Hi. And, and can I start by saying I'm really sorry that we weren't able to host everybody at the Guild Hall uh, in, the, in the City of London this year for obvious reasons, but we very much look forward to being able to do that again uh, in the future. Um, look, to answer your question, I think uh, and a number of the speakers have said that, that what has happened in, in the last uh, five months has taken us forward five or more years. Um, but at the heart of this is people. And I think more and more people uh, are wanting to exercise more choice and, and have more flexibility about how they uh, conduct their lives and, and develop their careers. And, and in the square mile in, in the city of London, we, we very much uh, hear from um, the occupiers of the buildings and, and those that come and work and, and, and that run businesses in the square mile, that cities are not dead um, at all. And we're, we're hugely optimistic about the future, um, but it will be a very different uh, city and the environment uh, will be different for all the reasons that we've been talking about, not least of all people's health. Um, and, and, and just a sense of, of well-being, which I think people just increasingly uh, want, to, uh, want to have. And that will determine ultimately where people choose to work. So I think we're going to find there's going to be more um, hybrid um, uh, working uh, environments. Certainly in the city of London, we are embracing uh, travel. Um, and we did that uh, as part of our transportation response uh, in, in pretty um, fundamental uh, and transformative ways in the square mile um, uh, in the response to the pandemic by widening pavements and giving, giving road uh, back to uh, pedestrians and to cyclists. So, you know, we're really embracing walking and cycling uh, and we will transform the square mile to, to make that a lot safer and, and a lot easier for people to do. And in just briefly, in terms of our planning policies, we we absolutely are, are wanting to embrace um, uh, buildings, uh, modern buildings that are designed to encourage movement, active travel with natural light and well-being at their heart. So we we, we do expect developers to um, uh, follow the Del the Delos Well Building Standard. Now I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Delos Well Building Standard, but it is a really important standard in our view and, and, and brand new building in Bishopsgate, number 22 Bishopsgate, just been completed, designed by Sir Stuart Lipton. It's an amazing building. Nearly 15% of the entire floor space is given over to wellbeing and amenities. So that's one great example of, of walking the talk. Brilliant. Thank you, Keith. I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it, that it's not just about having great public leisure or you know lots more gyms it's about that entire benevolent environment in which our 
community operate that's really going to change I think I mean David can I bring you in as you know representative of the gym group and just trying to understand you know how you guys have seen those trends accelerate growth for your business and challenges you might have had and how you've managed um, this sort of very volatile sort of time sure I think um <clears throat> As quite a few people have already said, it's a trend that's not new. It's not something that has come about through recent events this year with the pandemic. It's something that's been developing over time. We heard about sort of the Generation C, I think you called it, as Generation Customer. Um, you know, Gen Zs are around. Everybody in that sort of generation and uh, beyond that um, is moving towards you know that less ownership, looking for more experiential than actual purchase um, and that coupled with you know the general environment of health and well-being and um, sustainable lifestyle as well in terms of looking after one's own health and what we eat and what we do um, provision of exercise facility and and gyms fits in very well and is is um, part of that ongoing trend and con we're still seeing continuous growth in the sector and more and more people participating uh, and particularly when we get to uh, the, the video about affordable exercise it's where we position ourselves and actually getting those facilities into communities um, where it is affordable for them uh, is key to sort of our mission if you like mm. it, it's great to be able to provide you know luxurious and high-end sports facilities or, or um, leisure but actually straightforward exercise and affordable rate um, in within the communities and within high streets and in accessible locations is where we need to be and I guess this this year is only time will tell but this year um, you know the expectation from everybody is that that will accelerate uh, as it seems to be accelerating everything else I mean well known saying there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen yeah. Um, it's been exhausted over recent months, I know, but uh, it still rings true. But time will tell what happens towards the end of next year, but an expectation that a lot more people will be engaging and thoughtful about their own health and fitness and the benefits. Uh, hopefully government, local authorities will also engage and recognise more uh, what that can bring to the community. Mm. That's really interesting, David. I think I've got, aside from the, my giant list of questions, I've got another one, which is about the power of the built environment on people's health and lifestyles and well-being. And, you know, wanting to ask the panel about what towns and cities will look like in five to 10 years. And part of that, as you're saying, is that um, wider environment. I mean, Jim, can I come to you? I mean, as a town planner, what's your view on this? Do you think local authorities will be more demanding of developers of, of businesses around incorporating not just more health and well-being but also you know allowing more businesses that give us that space to flourish in all kinds of communities like David mentions I think almost Sam uh, good afternoon everyone I, almost in, inevitably yes that local planning authorities are going to get more demanding and I, I think it's right um, that they should do so um, I think um, if, if we, in, from, a, from a, I'm a planner, so looking from a planning perspective, um, the impact of the built environment can have on health and well-being has long been recognised. If you go back to the model villages and the garden city movement, at the end of the 18th, 19th, beginning of the 19th century, um, and even in the, the sort of post Second World War reconstruction, health was very much at the fore in in the planning of that um, large building boom albeit as well-intentioned as it was, much of the housing hasn't lasted the test of time. I think, I think more recently, um, and this is pre-COVID, there has been heightened awareness of the importance of health and well-being. And um, that's going to be uh, accelerated now because of that pandemic. Um, but again, taking a historical perspective before we look forward, if, if you think about some of the flatted developments that were built in the 1990s and early early 2000s, quite often they didn't have balconies, no direct access to outside space. Yet the um, and the, the communal areas would be grassed areas that would, that would be what's left over from the the amount of car parking um, that was laid out. 
now um, there's a much greater emphasis on access to external space, whether that's that's private space or um, or, or communal space. And I, what we've also noticed is that this is doing our um, planning applications and promoting developments is that much greater attention now has been given to the quality of provision of play space and also opportunities for older children um, about about facilities you can provide for them about designing public realms so people can meet, can meet uh, and in, interact and i think one of looking forward one of the, the the big opportunities for us is there's a huge amount of money coming out of government now through the towns fund something like 3.6 billion going to 100 town centers and a, a significant proportion of that will go towards improving the public realm and i would like to see some of that also um, that investment being made into public parks, whether they're in town centres or not, because one of the things that I saw um, throughout the, the, the first lockdown was the uh, huge amount of activity in public parks, and the importance they have uh, to serving our local communities. Thank you, Jim. I mean, that's really fascinating. I think what we're seeing is you know, trends that were happening anyways, our urban environments that were changing, consumers changing, we don't see that going away. Um, and hopefully, you know, lots of stakeholders, our public sector, our governments are also moving towards that. I mean, Carl and Louise, can I bring you both in at this point, thinking about real estate and the changes going on there? I mean, Carl, you're, from your experience, do you feel that, you know, with the built environment, there are changes that we can make around health and well-being? And where does it sit, you know, with businesses like David's, for example, that are looking to grow, um, that are looking at different sort of innovative models? What's your view on, on that? Thanks, Sam, and yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, think, I think for us, I should sort of, sort of kind of say that the main reason we're kind of interested in being here today is some, some kind of research we did recently looking at the, you know, the impact on, of, of the kind of built environment on accessibility more, more kind of generally, and particularly focus at cities and particularly focus at our role as property managers and really kind of looking at how we could improve accessibility for a, a range of people, not just through sort of um, kind of um, grab rails and wheelchair ramps, but around um, kind of impacts of the built environment on people who are suffering from mental health conditions, which have been on the rise or neurodiverse conditions and these sorts of things. But the reason I kind of bring that up is, is, is that the, this kind of surprising, but not really surprising when you read around, around the science of it, but the, the kind of surprising finding for us was the importance of um, the need to improve the air quality of our urban environments to then enable a, a, a kind of greater sort of health and well-being outcomes. And really, until you tackle that issue, everything else is kind of a sticking plaster on 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 the kind of bigger problem. So we can kind of like use exercise and other sort of means, meditation and yoga and all these sorts of things to to, to try and improve and manage our sort of physiologies down. But unless you kind of treat the kind of root cause of the problems, which is largely around um, air pollution's impact on our, on our bodies, then you're, it's always going to be um, a problem that's going to need to be fixed as we go. So I think for me, by looking at some of the sort of wider trends and how to manage those, that will then help make those outcomes far better give them more longevity and make them kind of stickier if you like in, in those urban environments and you know just kind of picking up on a point Louise made around bringing in some wider environmental themes here I think as as we look ahead to how cities may be in kind of five years ten years or even over the next two years depending on how how much what we've learned from COVID actually kind of like takes hold if we do start to see electrification of transport which will have a knock-on effect on improving air quality and if we do see um, a greater focus on placemaking as opposed to buildings, as was, as was, was mentioned earlier. And if we do see more around kind of bringing urban parks and greenery back into city centres, as with the example about Rome, that will start to kind of enable sort of people to, to kind of really flourish and thrive in those environments and may actually tempt people back into cities. So I think at the moment, you know, we've had the kind of situation where we have evolved and developed with cities. And now with the lockdown, we've all been at home. It's almost like the the kind of proverbial frog being able to jump out of the pan of warming water and we're now looking back at that and saying actually do we want to jump back into that 
pan, which is almost boiling, or do we want to kind of like take time to sort of turn the gas off and then work out what we want to do and what we need from our city? So that's the sort of um, metaphor I use to explain where we are right now. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. That's I mean, a fascinating you... metaphor. Right? <laughs> I'm trying to get my head around that one. Feel that great. one. <laughs> yes, turning the gas off would be, feels like it would be a really good idea, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in thinking about where this, what the cities are going to look like in 2030, I mean, one of the things that we're thinking about a lot is by the time we get to 2030, I mean, we're moving to a net zero carbon economy. So what does the economy look like? Because a lot of what the economy looks like then drives what the cities look like. In order to get to a net zero carbon economy, yes, we have to have complete transition of the car fleet. Um, you know, all of that road transport has to no longer be, you know, diesel and, and car. That's that's the that's the direction of travel for that. Um, so that then transitions the the the, um, uh, the air quality in, in in a number of different ways. It also puts a huge amount of stress on the grid in terms of the where we're going to get our power from. So again, there needs to be a huge amount of investment in in, in renewables and things that, that that are going to manage to support that. So there's a lot of very big um, kind of infrastructure questions that the towns and cities are going to have to deal with and, and and manage over the next few years in order to enable us to 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 cope with um, with what we need to do in order to avert the worst climate change. So that's all, that, that's all going to be happening. But I think from a from a from a, a health and well-being and, and that the opportunity for those businesses, yeah, I mean. It, it, it's absolutely what we want to see um, and what most asset owners are wanting to see is how we um, can accommodate and, 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 and make work the, the, the rise for these kinds of um, use that, are, that, are, that are, are here to stay in terms of how we, um, you know, in terms of sports and active and activity and leisure and much more about experience and much less about stuff. Mm because uh, you know one is you know it's a sustainability um, professional working in a in, in a retail environment I am fundamentally constantly conflicted <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean I mean that is fascinating I do feel like you you guys know me I feel like I can talk about this all day but I wanted to also just ask you guys about some of those more I suppose concrete things that are happening so you know David and Keith I know you guys are doing some fascinating work changing business models trying new things which is fascinating within these broader you know large big you know changing real estate companies I mean David can I ask you about how Jim Group has experienced that how you guys have innovated um, within your business yeah sure it's um alluding back to a uh, previous answer really in terms of trying to access some of these um, smaller communities catchment areas uh, and still make our business model work with um, you know a an affordable um, facility for everybody and um, to do it with low membership in a gym in a lower catchment area but we are seeing that is is possible um, and we are seeing that that um, that market and that penetration into um, certain areas is increasing over time. So it, it's you know uh, hopefully the the current environment and trend will continue and accelerate uh, and engage more people and more communities in in uh, you know a, a lifestyle that includes exercise and includes going to the gym. And in terms of you know, being able to deliver gyms on a smaller size, a smaller scale, and still make them accessible is the challenge that we have. Um, and then actually delivering it in a sustainable way. So we talk about high street and availability of property. Clearly there is um, a move to online that's been accelerated, which will hopefully free up yeah. um, additional uh, properties at, at, you know, what become affordable rents. And we can get into areas that previously perhaps have been um, prohibitive to us um, with, with better positioning of rent um, and the availability of sites in, in smaller areas which may otherwise have been 100% occupied. So yeah. being able to take our model, um, affordable access to gyms for smaller communities in smaller catchment areas and continue to find you know, innovative ways of delivering that to, um, to everybody really. I think those, I mean, that, that point is a really important one around rent isn't it? Because yeah, you will absolutely. have been you will have been completely locked out of a huge number of sites because of the amount of money that we traditionally have been able to rent to fashion retail brands for. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think and that's where our mental levels are set. And the, the model, that's the model I was alluding to in that keynote is that's the that's a massive problem for society generally, if all of the space is locked up in that way. And we're trying really hard to transition that out so that we can actually have almost a dynamic renting policy whereby if, if your your business is a different operating model than, I mean, obviously most of the fashion retail brands are now not-for-profit businesses, aren't they? But um, your retail mo your model is, is, is different and you're gonna inevitably have a different level of rent you can offer, but what you bring to the area is hugely beneficial. So that yeah. needs to be recognized somehow. Um, and that's a really hard conversation, um, but it's one that we ha absolutely have to have as an industry. Yeah, I think we are seeing that. Certainly, if you go back three or four years, the, the opportunities to get space onto retail parks was, was just virtually non-existent. Now we're seeing that you know, in excess of 50% of you know, our pipeline and portfolio because they are becoming accessible. And great, I really think over recent years, we've demonstrated our value that we can bring to uh, retail parks and, and other locations to landlords. Um, you know, we're not fly by nights, we're here to stay and we are in line with the current trend and, and the demographic. Yeah, but what you can't have is in five years time at a rent review, suddenly we're going, exactly. oh, but we can let it to this person that there's much more rent. So actually this is what the rent's gonna be and you can't, you will no longer be able to afford it. That has to change. Yeah, and that's where I think we're starting to demonstrate our value mm. to a landlord, not just on a, a pure rental basis. Brilliant. I mean, that is a tricky question, that commerciality. Hopefully, as demand changes and as consumers change, that that will come. I mean, Keith, can I ask what you're seeing in the square mile and interesting innovations that you guys are making around health and well-being, how you're finding that in the COVID era? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just want to pick up on air quality because it's such an important area. Um, I mean, I think it was Ibrahim quoted the figure for London, 36,000 premature deaths in, in a year. Across the UK, it's 64,000 yeah. premature deaths uh, from um, breathing polluted air. So, so it's a really important question when you look at um, the, the, um, the incre increasing activity um, uh, from a, an exercise point of view. We've been, we've been um, working to, to improve the quality of the air in London for some years now. Uh, the City of London Corporation chairs the um, Air Quality Steering Group for London. And we've seen significant improvements. Pre-COVID, we, we have got the um, air quality improved by 35% in the square mile. That improvement has doubled through the pandemic for obvious reasons. But it's a really important improvement in the quality of the air, which we are determined to maintain both by reducing the number of motor vehicles in the square mile, but also dealing with touching on what's just been discussed, the non-transport related sources of, 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 of NOx and, and, and emissions. Uh, so climate action, really important. Um, we've just spent an awful lot of time putting a, a climate action strategy together, uh, which deals with um, all the sources of emissions. Um, interestingly, um, from a local authority perspective, it's very challenging for local authorities to fund a lot of what needs to happen in this space. I mean, it's difficult enough sometimes for private property and, and, and property investment companies, uh, but it is enlightened self-interest uh, because uh, I think as Louise said, tenants and occupiers are going to demand uh, that buildings have got the right EPC, um, EPC certifications and they are uh, sustainable and energy efficient. Um, so we've put, a, we've put a £70 million um, programme together for the next uh, six years to get our emissions to net zero by 2027. Mm. Uh, that's the City of London Corporations. And we own a lot of property. We are a private property investor uh, with a portfolio which is worth about £3.5 billion. Pounds, uh, and our, our objective is to get that to net zero uh, by 2027. That's quite an ambitious target, but it absolutely has to happen. Uh, so, so those those sorts of things are, are where we're hoping to be able to lead the way for the public sector, yeah. in particular, because we are that we are in that unique position of being able to be a local authority and a, a private property owner and a landlord, etc., which which does make, make it um, possible for us to, to 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 take these sorts of positions. Yeah, and absolutely, Keith, and that long term view, I would imagine, is also really important. The businesses like David, who, as he said, you know, they're there to stay in different sorts of communities, making those businesses and those buildings accessible is going to be crucial for the next generation. I mean, Jim, I'd like to bring you in here and, you know, from your perspective in terms of development, you know, 
work that you're seeing, like what opportunities are there to bring physical activity, you know, accessible spaces? What opportunities are there that you're seeing? Any insight? Uh, Sam, two different ones really to do, do spring to mind from, from my work and our, our, our work. Uh, the first is that, um, and, it, and this relates both to larger cities and also, uh, also smaller towns and smaller cities. Um, we, we've been asked to do quite a lot of feasibility studies which are looking at the um, either wholesale or substantial redevelopment of shopping centres um, and their car parks. Um, and what we're seeing is a coming together of the um, government's policy agenda. They've been beating the drum very hard since 2012, the need for new homes. And that perhaps being the salvation for uh, a high street that otherwise is going to be in, um, in, in, in great decline. So I think um, there is, there is a, some, some, some really interesting work and what, what most of that um, has, has revealed is it's still difficult, the viability is still marginal, but I think the, the balance will tip in favour of redevelopment. It will take some years, I think, but I think the, the, the value balance is, is tipping. And I think what we might see is a finer grain of development in town centres with, because of the fast um, pace of change, the, there'd be building blocks which can um, be used for lots of different uses. Um, but those uses won't be predominantly comparison retail, which has been the sort of hardcore stuff uh, of the past. And at a very um, different end of the scale, um, some interesting um, work that I've been involved is, is, is looking at how we can make better use of um, the dual use of school facilities. Our and, kids um, will love you, Jim, for that. Okay. <laughs> Our kids team will love you for that. I, 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 and it's a, I, I find it a really, it's a really interesting area where you've got um, schools, whether it's state or private schools, that have got land um, available. They've got a need for improved sports facilities, perhaps a multi-use games area or an AstroTurf type pitch. Um, there's a collaboration with either local sports clubs or with Sport England or organisations like that to provide um, some funding. And um, I think there's plenty of potential for this. I think the, the thing that's stopping more of this type of thing happening is um, a lack of people to facilitate it. Um, so it's a need for uh, professional uh, expertise um, because a school is working out outside its core area too. So I think I think there's a lot a lot a lot, a lot more scope uh, for the dual use of um, facilities. Most of the work I've been doing uh, is on this has been in London, but I think it's something that can easily repli replicate um, to anywhere in the UK. Thank you, Jim, and it, it speaks to that adapt adaptability of our spaces and sort of flexible use and what people are expecting from the places they live. I mean, so many opportunities. I mean. I don't know where the time is going, racing away. So I wanted to just come to a couple of our questions we've received um, from our audience. Um, a big one here, which is who will lead the changes needed? Is local government the only organization that has the necessary powers and legitimacy to bridge the gap between public developers and operators? Who wants to take that? Carl? <laughs> oh. I think this kind of comes down to what the like what or well sorry who the built environment is for and ultimately if a development's happening in a given location it has to be centered on the needs of that local area and the custodians of the local area is the local authority so there, so there, there does need to be that kind of like partnership approach between the needs of the developer which you know in in many cases not all cases uh, is going to be about maximizing the return on the investment they're making potentially to, to the detriment of the quality of the product which they're delivering. Mm. And, you know, I, th I think housing is, is, you know, a classic kind of area of focus there. You know, we have the smallest houses, in, you know, in, 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 certainly in Western Europe, if not, if not Europe as a whole, by some margin. Average new build house area is 76 metres squared. Average in France is 112, in Germany 109. You know, this is significantly smaller. And, yeah. and I think, again, you know, it's hard, it's hard not to sort of look at where we are now with the pandemic. But you know, if people are being forced to stay in their homes, the homes have got to be fit for habitation. They have to be big. They have to have areas to be able to sort of live and work in separate areas, not working in your bedroom, in your studio flat. So I think there does need to be a bit of a partnership approach between what local authorities expect 
as the, being the best for their citizens and the developers who are coming in just really to kind of like you know, turn turn that development around as quickly as it as quickly as they can for for, you know, for the biggest margin. So, you know, local authorities do certainly have a very key role to play in ensuring you know that, that any development meets the needs of their population. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. Anyone else on that? That leading that collaboration. I mean, I, I, I think I'd just add to that that it's. Um, the, obviously the, the local authority is, is, is well placed but needs a huge amount of support. I mean, the local authorities are so under pressure in such a number of different areas and are really incentivized around hitting housing targets. So if, if, you, if they're faced with a, with a developer look, pointing at a viability statement and saying, well, if, I, if you make me do that, I'm just not gonna be able to build it, that's quite a hard place for them to be. Um, there needs to be a much more, I, I suppose, visionary um, sort of sense of leadership and collaboration across all, across the industry to make sure that we're delivering the right kind of spaces for the future. Because as, as Carl says, if we're just delivering space that is too small for people, we're effectively developing tomorrow's ghettos. And, and that's that's not a great place to be for any location and for or for any business. Mm. Thank you, Louise. I mean, Keith, you were going to say, you were going to add your views. Well, I was just going to sort of give a, a City of London perspective briefly because it is it is a unique um, uh, it's a, it's a unique um, square mile as it's referred to. It, it sits on a on a medieval street pattern, but it's but it's a twenty first century uh, commercial district. I mean, one of the things that, that that we've found to be incredibly important and 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 useful in in in, in moving the built environment into the space that we're discussing. Uh, is to work with investors and with developers. So it's very much a partnership. And um, I mean, the square miles competitiveness to which we are committed to uh, preserving, maintaining and promoting the financial and professional services sector, that's part of the role of the City London Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the competitiveness of the square mile is based on the quality of its infrastructure, the built environment and its unique ecosystem. Um, and that is only going to continue to be the case if the investment uh, comes in and developers want to continue to develop and invest to attract people to work uh, in, in those locations and buildings. And I think that theme is constant throughout the UK. You know, you've got to want to go into a building to work and increasingly I think that's going to be the case. And I genuinely think that people will start and they are doing anyway, particularly um, younger people are looking at where the, uh, the buildings are, what the amenity is, how it feels to be uh, in, in and around the area, uh, in, in deciding where they want to work and, and, and develop their careers. So you know, I think people will, will drive this, but, but Louise is absolutely right. I mean, there's huge pressures on local government. Uh, there's a whole lot of challenges in, in funding. There's a huge amount of pressure to deal with housing. And then, and then there's, there's this dealing with the economic and social impacts of the pandemic. So it's not going to be easy. Yeah, thank you for that, Keith. I mean, David, do you have any views on that, on that leading the collaboration or, or changes? And as a sort of a fast paced operator, what, what are your views and, and what are you seeing on that front? I, I agree wholeheartedly with um, both Carl and Keith on that. Um, that it, firstly, it does need to be collaborative, and I would say not just with developers, but with private operators as well. Ultimately, if you're going to build something, you need somebody to occupy it and do something with it. Um, but in a lot of these places, it does require the local authority to take the lead because they are ultimately the people who can, if not make things happen, can help make things happen. Um, but, I mean, somebody mentioned earlier, I think it might have been Louise, about you know multiple local ownership and landlords make some of this very difficult um, and it's not really a question of I think lamenting the demise of the high street is or thinking about built new environments and built spaces we need to repurpose what we've got mm. actually this sort of rapid shift that we've seen will we'll, you know, ease pressure on commercial building a lot of people are going to be working from home there's going to be less use of space less need for space and perhaps hopefully less demand on retail space and it will give us the opportunity to occupy some of these spaces. Uh, and you know, you, you, five years is a very, very short time period when it comes to development. Um, and actually, if we're going to address some of the uh, climate change issues that we have, then it has to be with the existing uh, estate that you know, the country has and not necessarily just focusing on new built environment. And again, that does come down to 
you know, the role of local authorities um, across the board, but also, you know, particularly in our sector, they are leisure providers, they are gym providers, mm. and don't rule out the use of you know, private sector uh, providers such as ourselves when a community uh, is looking for you know, facilities for exercise and improving well-being. You know, it's not just cities, you know, we want to be in the you know, the Stockports and the Grimsby's and the Swindon's of this world and not just in the Birmingham's and London's and, and other places as well. Yeah. You know, that's where real people live. Um, and, you know, they don't have gardens and have places to go. So outdoor environments and actually affordable facilities uh, for exercise are key to them. And I think local authorities and particularly central government in creating the right environment to stimulate some of this um, have a leading role, but it does need to be funded. Brilliant, thank you. So we've got um, a few more questions. I mean, Jim, to your point we, about schools, I mean, we've had a question and a comment from someone leading the National Sport and Wellbeing Project for the Church of England and being open to adapting those spaces for accessible facilities. So you can see how lots of organisations are thinking about how they use their facilities. So go on, Jim. Yeah, I, 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 I saw the I saw that um, the question or, or the uh, um, that that thought being put down, and I, I thought it was very interesting because there's this huge um, amounts of land and facilities that we can make better use of it, and that's why I mentioned the sc the schools and the, the Church of England's another uh, important stakeholder that could get I'm sure could get more involved and seems seems clearly seems to be willing to willing to do so. I think in terms of the the the, the, the central government local government issue we just discussed mm. um there's been a, a planning white paper out in august and um about planning for, it's called planning for the future and i did a word count on that and new homes and houses that those two words was mentioned over 200 times and health was mentioned four times so i think um the government can uh, do more in terms of um celebrating the importance of health and activity and well-being and I'm, I'm sure that is going to happen um, as a result of, of, of the pandemic and then that provides the impetus um, to uh, do more locally empowers uh, local authorities to do more the problem has just been mentioned it always comes back to this when we talk about planning is the lack of resources along with everything else to bring about meaningful change but that is something that the government is seeking uh, is seeking to 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 address and it's, yeah. it's something that's very important brilliant thank you Jim. i know we've got a few more questions to go so i'm going to try and get one more in which is um i think even as we were prepping for the panel we were talking about you know, cities and regional. So um, someone has asked a question about, you know, some of the examples we've heard focus on development of public space um, and facilities within major cities. Does that equally transpose to regional towns? Um, any views on that? I mean, I would say, yeah, absolutely, of course it does. It's the regional town, the regional towns, the reasons that are, are in many ways experiencing um, a real, they're kind of really under the spotlight of, as far more people are are at home and 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 that's where they tend to tend to be. Um, so uh, so I think some of the regional high streets particularly have um, and, and those local areas have really begun to flourish over the over the last nine months, whereas the city centres are are particularly kind of empty. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a huge amount of opportunity there. Which, which is fantastic and I think as, as, as I said before I think the genie is out of the bottle in terms of flexible working we will completely change the way in which we actually approach our working day it's not going to be the same as it has been over the last nine months but it will transition um, and it will be very different and I think a lot of those regional towns will be the will, will be the beneficiaries of that and therefore there will have to be there will be an expectation that those uh, that the public spaces um, and the green spaces within those within those um, regional towns and cities are, um, are, are are providing the same kind of facility. And I think in terms of kind of the, the benefits, as I said, I've been, I think the, 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 the dividend that we will get in terms of um, improving 
improved health and well-being and, and, and mental well-being as a result of this is 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 massive and and it's really interesting Jim's point about the uh, about the planning about the white paper just not really <clears throat> picking up on health being a being such a it's such a kind of massive opportunity whereas you know the cost of poor health is ex exponential in this country now so anything that we can do that resolves that or starts to tackle that is going to be hugely beneficial financially as well as um, just generally for the population. Absolutely. Sam, can I just come in on that one? Yeah, Jim, um, go for it. I mentioned previously the, um, the, the monies that are available from government in the Towns Fund, which mm. runs to several billions. As part of their levelling up agenda, that money is going to be uh, enjoyed by regional towns and cities far more so than um, the larger, larger towns and cities. So I, I think what that will do is we'll, when, once we see the fruits of uh, that uh, public money, um, it will give those types of towns far greater confidence other than then looking on and seeing, we, we see some examples of best practice and see all, a lot of the issues we've been talking about really being grappled with in practice. And um, I think that will make a very significant, uh, a very, a very significant difference. And um, the, the amount of money is large. Um, the High Street Task Force is, is is in existence and now now working hard, and uh, it will. It's easy talking about big metropolitan centres in London. They're probably uh, better able to take care of themselves. I think what this will do is give um, the the regional towns and many of the regional towns and cities a really a, a good leg up, as it were. Brilliant. I mean, thank you so much for that, Jim. I really wanted to get another question in, but I don't think we're going to have the time. Um, I mean, thank you so much um, to the panel, to all of you. I mean, as we said at the top of the session, I mean, two hours just doesn't feel enough to cover, you know, the, the myriad of issues that are facing, you know, the urban environment, but the opportunity for physical um, activity and our sector moving forward. So I feel like, you know, let's plan a follow up session as soon as we can, basically. Thank you to everybody um, who also wrote in and, and, you know, gave us questions to fuel our debate. It's greatly appreciated.